Right, so people will be coming in as we go. Uh, Moodle MOOC 4 is, is uh, focusing on two areas, on teaching and learning online with 34 presentations, and on Moodle training for uh, beginners and for non-beginners. So let's get started with our speaker. Our speaker is with a star there is Brenda Mallinson. Brenda is a program specialist, uh, learning technologies at SAIDE in Johannesburg, South Africa. She works on a number of educational technology and open education resources projects at HEIs across sub-Saharan sub Africa. And if you've never heard that term, So, Brenda, I'll let you start. Oh, she's a neighbor. That's nice, Andrea. So, Brenda, you've got a neighbor there in the chat. Yes, I hear you really well, but for some reason, I don't know why I can't see you. The live video is on. I'm not sure why. Uh, but perhaps you should not worry about yeah. that. No, no, it's okay. It's, it's better for bandwidth. So that, uh, yeah, I took mine away as well. If anyone feels that the uh, they can stop Brenda's uh, so-called uh, video that's kind of streaming, even though we can't see it, and it'll make your, uh, I'll let you start, right, Brenda. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much, Lily. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I can see some friends in the participant list. Hello, Tom. Um, Andrea, hello to you. I take it you're from somewhere in Africa as well. Uh, that's really wonderful. Uh, right, the presentation today is on exploring online and blended modes of delivery in our context uh, in Africa. And in one way, our context is not so much different to the rest of the world. And in another way, I think because of some challenges that we experience here, we become much more conscious of various factors uh, and considerations that we have to make uh, when, when we're engaging in uh, or attempting to engage in online learning. Uh, I should explain uh, the SADE, S-A-I-D-E, stands for the South African Institute of Distance Education, uh, where I'm currently employed, one of the places I'm currently employed. Uh, so this is the outline of my talk, just to talk uh, generically about the converging a uh, higher education environment, uh, uh, some delivery mode continue that we'll explore, having a look at some uh, environmental variables. Uh, and then I will, I'm going to propose a visual representation of, of how, the, how we should consider these factors and then a conclusion. Uh, the reason I mention I'm from the South African Institute uh, for Distance Education is that um, this particular talk I'm approaching from a distance education point of view. Uh, prior to my employment here, I was full-time uh, at a face-to-face -face university, and it's been really interesting for me to see the differences between the two mindsets, with, of course, my particular interest, online learning, being able to span both of them. Right, this is one of my favorite diagrams that I, I found in 2010. Uh, Derek Wenmark is a New Zealander. He's got a lovely blog called Core Education. And for me, it really depicted that convergence that I've just been chatting about uh, between what we thought of previously as our face-to-face -face classrooms and distance education, which were really quite different and discrete, uh, and the convergence uh, that, that resulted. I think this was part of Derek Wenmark's PhD um, materials which I, he is now finished. Uh, so, so moving along, you'll see the now actually means 2010, but what are we looking at now is that there's this really interesting convergence and a lack of, dis lack of the same kinds of distinction between face-to-face uh, -face and distance, and, and that really, uh, really epitomizes what I'm planning to uh, explore today.
So migration from the traditional paper-based distance learning, which one can think of as being by correspondence, to that new teaching and learning online or blended environment uh, needs to be undertaken within the context of an institutional environment as a whole. And you'll see on this, on this uh, table, starting from policies and strategies, taking cognizance of many interlinked elements. And these contextual elements include your program, curriculum and learning design, academic staff development, your target learner demographics, the way they access the course, the context, the physical environment within which they are studying, and the available and appropriate information and communication technology infrastructures and both, importantly, we're thinking of this both within and outside uh, our institutional environment. And we need to think of all of this with reference to the existing platforms and the modus operandi already deployed at the university. Now this, uh, what we call our educational technology stack, I've adapted it from uh, Stephen Marquard's educational technology stack. Uh, he's a fellow researcher in South Africa at the University of Cape Town. And this really provides us with quite a useful initial framework uh, to create a conducive environment if we are moving, uh, or wanting to move uh, online. Uh, I think I've mentioned all of all of the elements here at various stages of, of, of projects. I've concentrated on on different types of things here, um, and really quite extensively on 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 that sort of almost the middle uh, layer in the stack, which is the academic staff professional development, has been a particular area of interest of mine. Right, and Thinking of these continuums of, or a continuum of educational provision, uh, so the first one we're examining is fairly traditional. We're moving to saying purely face to face, which is how we thought of as a con what we thought of as a contact institution, right through to education solely at a distance. So, uh, and then something in between in mixed mode. We have a very large uh, purely distance education university. Uh, in South Africa called UNISA. It's, uh, depending on who you talk to, I think it's in the region of 400,000 uh, students, which is quite large. Uh, and even they attempted, even pre-web days, to get into contact with their students via small group discussions in various demographic areas. So I think there's probably always been some kind of mixed mode uh, that was taking place. Another more resource-based or independent learning in face-to-face -face programs, and there's more face-to-face -face interaction in distance. So things are starting to move uh, somewhat, and with the growing use of, of our technology in education, what we're anticipating is a rapid move to the center of this continuum. So now we're thinking of distance education delivery, but we're using the web. So um, the types of e-learning using the web used to be commonly referred to as, is it web supported, web dependent, is your course fully online? And so we're tempted to represent that on a continuum as well. So starting with, uh, on the left hand side, we're saying something is fully offline, then moving through, is it supported by the web, uh, web dependent, or is it fully online? And importantly, uh, for me, it's quite important that an expanded definition of e-learning that I like to use includes the use of all digital resources, systems, hardware devices, and electronic communication in the support of education. And I think my emphasis uh, on that is, is partly because of the context in which I live and work. Uh, again, examining this, uh, these traditional terms of web-supported and web-dependent, um, I began to think that they were too specific. Uh, and so I have preferred to use the terms, I'm moving towards using the terms internet supported and internet dependent. I think I'm possibly one of the few people uh, attending today that uh, was around pre-web, and yet I can remember 
uh, being able to use email, etc. So for me, um, it's it's important to make distinctions like that. So moving to your second dimension now, we've got our first dimension is our spatial or geographic distribution of the teachers and learners. So we've got the face-to-face, -face, thinking of it as an on-campus situation, and on the right-hand side of the first continuum, we have distance education and off-campus. And what we're thinking about now is that we can introduce a second dimension, which is what is the extent of the ICT support that we are providing for the teachers uh, and learners? So notice on the left-hand side, we've got something called digitally supported and no digital support, and those are in fact offline. They don't have to be online. So in internet-supported programs, participation online is an option or an alternative for learners. In internet-dependent programs, participation via the internet would be a requirement, and that could include online interaction, communication, access to course materials via the web. So some sort of uh, online communication might simply be, I'm going to use my email as part of this course. In fully online programs, there's no physical face-to-face -face component, although, of course, there could be a virtual face-to-face -face component. And as I said, in our African context, it's pertinent to also consider digital forms of support that don't require internet access. Uh, and those forms for learning could be offline via a CD or DVD, uh, and a further detail could be expressed by clarifying exactly which elements of that on-site ICT dimension may be on or offline. Now, of course, when we look at this, I'm trying to represent it visually in a continuum, but of course, within a particular course, learning could be supported both online and digitally offline at different stages of the course. So the continued evolution of e-learning is contributing to the blurring of the distinction between face-to-face -face and distance education provision. So moving from there, we're saying it may be useful if we could conceptualize these two continue, continua in relation to each other. And what we land up then is with is a grid. So we've got a horizontal axis, axis that represents our uh, what we're now saying campus-based, hybrid or blended or remote. And we have a vertical axis that is representing that second ICT dimension uh, moving from offline, fully offline or digitally supported, uh, through to our various stages of online. So the circles positioned on the grid represent examples of actual courses or programs at higher education institutions. Uh, so for instance, you'll see in the very top right hand corner, I think it's a D, just, there we are, the D, it was an uh, MSc course in online learning that was offered at that stage at the University of, of uh, Edinburgh and various other uh, courses. You'll see um, the uh, number C uh, is firmly in that hybrid or blended area and it's uh, moving towards digitally supported, posh, I would say possibly partially digitally supported uh, would represent uh, where that sits. So if one thought of things in reference to this grid, and uh, it would enable a, an academic or faculty in a higher education institution to position a particular course or program, such as B, on the grid in terms of where they're situated right now, and then determine where the institution would like that course or program to move over a period of time. This could assist in identifying what changes would be required in order to reposition the course in terms of this grid and then lead to thinking about what are the other influencing factors or aspects of this course that would need to be taken into account 
what is our motivation for wanting to move it on the grid. Uh, and for me, it's quite a visual representation of something that I think previously hasn't been that tangible, of saying where do we as an institution, where would we like to be? Perhaps it's where would we as a department like to be or for a particular course. So one can view it at a number of different levels. Right, so thinking about the other characteristics or aspects of a course that would need to be taken into account, uh, one can look at various structural and pedagogical aspects uh, to inform the appropriate positioning of where you think a course should typically be uh, on a grid in order to, have, uh, to engage in really effective uh, teaching and learning. Uh, there's a lovely paper, Young and Chamberlain, 2006, they describe a blended learning continuum in terms of two discrete tracks of using, supporting or supplementing ICTs, differentiating the strategies that apply to the deployment of an independent learning environment from that which focuses on an interactive learning environment. And for me, this distinction is quite crucial. One really engages in a course in a different way depending on the level uh, of engagement or interaction or mediation uh, that one has planned for the course. In other words, your pedagogical model. So the exposition of these strategies would need to be underpinned by a particular educational approach that would in turn be informed by a third dimension, which is really the human dimension, which would need to be considered across all forms of provision. This is the extent to which the approach is fit for purpose in terms of our target audience, the purpose and level of the course being offered, as well as the extent to which an equivalent learning experience is offered across different, differing contexts of learning and practice. So thinking about that, uh, we start to move into this area of transactional distance in teaching and learning, uh, which is I think typically uh, determined by those three interrelated function of those sets of variables, our instructional dialogue, our program structure, and our learner autonomy. So how can we make the most of this changed environment for our learners? Thinking about these are what our dimensions are now. We're saying the one dimensional is that spatial separation, which certainly uh, distance educators uh, have been engaging in uh, for decades. And now we're saying did we want to determine the extent of the uh, digital or ICT support. And really importantly, uh, for me, another layer or dimension is thinking about that temporal dimension. And it's, uh, in other words, we're talking about what is going to be synchronous, what is going to be asynchronous. The flexibility of that temporal dimension in our technology-supported teaching and learning, for me, it provides a great pedagogical strength. Uh, I think we all know what, what these terms mean. Uh, synchronous is at the same time. Asynchronous means uh, people interact at different times, but you're still working together and collaborating towards a goal. Th this asynchronous nature of many of the communication and collaborative technologies currently available allows learners to reflect and contribute more meaningfully in an online dialogue, thus developing and, and improving their critical thinking skills. For me, one of the reasons that that's so important in our context is because we really we live in a, a, a multilingual uh, society. In South Africa, we have 11 different official languages, uh, although in many cases, certainly in higher education, uh, English has, uh, it has become the predominant language of communication, which means that the vast proportion of our learners are interacting online, using a language that sometimes is their third or fourth language. Uh, the notion of being able to construct an argument uh, 
post a contribution in a discussion forum after it's not only the careful consideration from a pedagogical point of view, it's also that a English third or fourth language speaker uh, would be able to construct their, that argument in a way that communicates the idea better uh, by reviewing their own use of the language. So in addition to be determined by fit for purpose, that appropriate use and extent of synchronous or asynchronous ICTs, uh, and this is introducing another very important factor, it could be determined by this important influencing factor of group or class size. So many things here uh, come under the human dimension that establishing your online presence, promoting your engagement and interaction, uh, defining that appropriate level of mediation. Uh, one can have small virtual groups online, they still need to be managed. I'd like to uh, have another uh, examine a little bit further this notion of synchronous and asynchronous. Uh, as uh, I, I came across these descriptions of course flow uh, on the Google Course Builder site uh, about a year or so ago, and for me it really, really spoke to me uh, in a way that um, it, it really described the way that I like to work uh, online. First of all, it defined as synchronous flow, students do all of their work at the same time as everyone else, and for a large portion of time, that's what happens if we are in our face-to-face -face classrooms. We're expecting everybody to be paying attention, etc., uh, at the same time. I think having interacted a lot with uh, distance educators over the last few years, it's ma it made me realize that they got very excited at the thought of synchronous communication and said, well, if the technology can do this, we want to be synchronous all the time, and I had to really hold them back and let them reflect and think about uh, what it meant uh, to be synchronous online and whether, in fact, that was going to serve their purposes adequately. The second distinction on this page was the asynchronous flow. Students do everything at their own pace and they don't have deadlines to consider. And I think for me this is where I started to think quite seriously uh, about what asynchronous means. We talk about asynchronous a lot, but is what we are doing online truly asynchronous? We do, in fact, have deadlines. Uh, generally, they're just at a, a different level. So this is what uh, was defined on the course builder site that I absolutely loved. They termed something as semi-synchronous flow. Students do some parts of the course at their own pace and do other parts of the course on a fixed schedule. Now that's not a new idea, that's what we usually are doing when we say asynchronous. We say we can study online, in your own pace, at your own time, but here's the deadline for your assignment, here's the deadline for your assessment, etc. So really nice to have a true definition of semi-synchronous. So instructors would release the course materials on a fixed schedule, and students can work on it any time after that. So there might be live events, such as question and answer sessions. Uh, those would happen at a fixed date and time, but the lovely thing is students can watch those at archived versions, much the same as we can in, uh, in this particular MOOC environment. And generally, assessments uh, are due by a fixed deadline. I really Love that. Unfortunately, I've heard that uh, Google are no longer supporting Course Builder, but for me, this was my takeaway from Course Builder, something that I just found really, really uh, interesting and informative. So that's just unpacking the notion of synchronous versus asynchronous. Uh, the next notion I'd like to unpack with regard to the way that we would uh, un uh, undertake the blending of our course Uh, is this notion of what is the level of communication, collaboration, interactivity, uh, etc., 
uh, of your course because again that varies a lot with some of these human dimensions that we've been talking about engagement and interaction do we want to establish our online presence or is this an independent learning situation uh, etc uh, this uh, diagram I'm sure you all know Terry Anderson's uh, second edition theory and practice of online learning uh, I love looking at this diagram because it scares me uh, to see a collaborative and community mode of online learning and what all the possibilities are and of course what scares me is what would it take to affect this uh, just as an aside uh, I was very fortunate to be uh, in Zimbabwe over the weekend last weekend where we had a conference for the African Council for Distance Education and Terry Anderson was one of our keynote speakers uh, which I absolutely loved and uh, really enjoyed chatting to this this very lovely and unassuming man uh, very very interesting so this is one of the most uh, important uh, and possibly the most difficult transition for the, le the teachers and the learners is adjusting to this online communication medium whether it is synchronous or asynchronous so we're talking around concepts and practice surrounding teaching and learning interaction engagement and facilitation so you can see all the different connecting nodes over here a tutor instructor to learner learner to learner and even an expanded environment we're bringing in the community here uh, etc so the roles and responsibilities of both the teacher and the learner are significantly changed in the online environment we're thinking of the teacher as a facilitator rather than the source of all knowledge uh, increased responsibility regarding acquiring skills in order to use that edtech appropriately uh, and the manner in which the lecturers and learners are afforded additional opportunities to communicate and collaborate on a more level footing and, and I think it's that level footing that uh, for people new to the online mode um, I think they feel a little bit nervous about that uh, at times so when we look at a diagram like this what we're thinking about is what one of the main issues is what is the level of mediation that we are planning what is possible given our context for a particular course or program so uh, the way that the deployment environment would be guided by an upfront decision concerning the level of mediation uh, that is to be employed in the online course uh, by the academic staff member so this factor could be this decision could be influenced by a number of factors including many of those aspects that were listed previously and again and again as I was moving into thinking about this this notion of large student numbers uh, was the a, a massive factor that I felt started dictating everything uh, the pedagogical approach that I was taking the level of interaction in the course uh, etc I was particularly conscious of this because when I was a full-time uh, lecturer at a university I was at a very small university uh, and now I'm much more conscious of our very large distance education university in South Africa that might have um, 20,000 students for instance in their economics one class and how do we cope with that do we manage them in small virtual groups what level of support would these students uh, require etc so thinking about this level of interaction um, I have a quote from uh, Diana Lorillard who I'm sure many of you will have read um, she believes that meaningful learning requires active student engagement including interactions between students and content students and other students students and faculty and when appropriate students and workplaces or communities so that in fact does speak uh, to very many elements of the Anderson diagram uh, she's consistently argued uh, that deep meaningful learning requires active student engagement 
so the extent to which this model would be desirable would really be determined by that pedagogical approach to the course and with reference uh, to the aspects that we had a look at in the table earlier. So having examined a number of these factors, the level of interaction, uh, et cetera, the synchronous, asynchronous, uh, we come back to this point of things being made very much more difficult uh, by the level of class size and the fact that this seems to drive a lot of our thinking around the mode of interaction. So going back to the grid is what I've attempted to do is to have a look at a, to try and superimpose another aspect that we're considering uh, on the grid. So this notion of group or class size, in other words, the enrollment for a particular instance of delivering a particular course or program, the size of that cohort enrolled would appear to be a major determinant of the nature and extent of the interactions possible. Uh, the need for the deployment of tutors that would manage smaller groups, the level of mediation employed by the lecturer and the tutors, and the level of support, and in fact the nature of the assessment, and all of that could determine, could be the determinant for the pedagogical approach. So what I've attempted to do here is to depict the class size or the cohort size as well when we're locating a course or program on the grid. And that's in order to indicate the extent to which the underlying aspects identified and discussed would need to be considered. So again, it's an attempt to create a visual representation, not only where do we stand with this, where are we geographically, campus-based or remote or in the middle, uh, where are, are we with regard to our digital support, and then another layer trying to depict uh, an alert he has a really big class size, so that would be determined by the size uh, of my circle. Uh, and that's just an initial attempt uh, to, to uh, provide a bit of an alert uh, so that one can indicate uh, what we need to consider there. And in addition, if the plan is to migrate a course to a different position on the grid over time, an indication of this aspect would provide a cautionary flag. I'm sorry, I've moved on here. I didn't mean to. to in other words, we're saying that this, by depicting the class size, by the size of our circles, it would provide a cautionary flag to prompt examination of the practical aspects that would need to be considered in order to affect such a migration. So we've simply varied the relative size of the circles that would denote a particular course. For example, it can easily be seen that the group for course C is larger than the group for course D, which in turn is larger than E, and A and B are rather small. So, some things to, to think about at the end. Uh, given the use of those continua and the attempt at a graphical representation as suitable vehicles to frame these dimensions of educational provision, it's clear that there's no single lend for delivery mode, but rather an infinite number of ways in which one could deploy a course or a program. Uh, so the development of that grid is an attempt to prompt careful consideration of the relevant aspects that affect that educational provision uh, in the blended and online mode. So that deployment uh, of ICTs, bringing in the second dimension, it opens up many more possibilities for more interactive engagement. But whether the affordances of ICT are used in this way must be a conscious design decision. So we're saying it must be, a, um, your course must be designed accordingly and uh, the ICT should be used to enhance the provision or delivery of your course uh, in your teaching and learning 
uh, and shouldn't be there just because we can kind of thing. So at a basic level, ICT can simply be used to transmit content uh, more efficiently, but we really need to think uh, a lot further than that. And in fact, it may not be the most efficient way even to do that basic thing, depending on the demographics uh, of your learners. So in institutions that consciously seek to use supporting ICTs to enhance their teaching and learning, the role of lecturer is changing to that of facilitator, learning environment designer, co-learner, and also includes content curation. The role of the learners is also changing, moving towards more self-directed independent study on the one hand, and on the other hand, greater collaboration and engagement, both with peers inside the institution and with others outside the institution. Uh, and that's a paraphrase uh, from an author, Plump, from 1999. I love reading authors from around about that time because they were thinking very philosophically about uh, the implications as we started engaging uh, with online learning. And uh, they were very deep papers that they were writing and articles and research reports uh, that in fact still hold true today. So our core assumptions of distance education, which are access, independence, and economy, uh, economies of scale, they need to be re-examined in the context of our online learning theory and practice where we're talking about collaboration, community, uh, and quality assurance. Uh, so, to think about the uh, influencing factors, we're talking about learning demographics, our class size has proved to be really important, our pedagogical approach, uh, and in summary our dimensions was the spatial separation, which was the geographic, which was the more traditional mode of uh, distance education, our temporal, thinking uh, in a fresh way about asynchronous and synchronous and semi-synchronous flows, and really importantly, uh, determining the extent of our uh, digital support. And, and emphasizing the meaningful uh, deployment of the digital support uh, to effect enhanced teaching and learning. Right, and a final thought from Tony Bates. Uh, good teaching may overcome a poor choice of technology, but technology will never save uh, bad teaching. Right, and that's it from me. Uh, you can see this uh, on SlideShare. My name on SlideShare is Brenda Six, and you're welcome to have a look at uh, this and other presentations that I have there. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, Brenda. That was amazing. It got us thinking about all kinds of areas. Questions? There was one question about Nigeria, I believe. Uh, does um, SAIDE state, does it support uh, Nigeria? I know it supports other countries, but I'm not sure about Nigeria. the University of Ibadan. Uh, and I've also worked at the University of Joss, which is in the center of the country. I'm not sure where our current Nigerians uh, come from, but I'm very happy to support people wherever they are. That was from Timmy. Another question is about quality assurance. Timmy asks, how does state quality assurance work? One of the, uh, uh, one of the aspects that we worked on in a very big project, um, it was the Partnership for Higher Education in Africa Educational Technology Initiative. Uh, this is a project that was running for five years that we've recently concluded, uh, where we worked in East, West and Southern Africa at seven different higher education institutions. Um, 
we developed a quality assurance, uh, in a, well, we called it a quality review instrument, uh, where we were uh, engaging in using it as a guiding tool as well as a review instrument uh, that is published uh, for online courses. Uh, we didn't concentrate on the pedagogical aspects. I, I must just say this in advance. We concentrated more on the, the the online aspects, as it were. And I will give you the URL for that right now uh, in the text box. Uh, there are several resources there that uh, are available as everything at that we do at SADI is available as an OER. So the outputs of all of these projects that we work on, uh, there we are. I hope that you can see that URL. Um, yeah, so there's, there's, a, there's a quality uh, ev uh, evaluation instrument there that uh, we worked on and we used for online courses, and we were able to publish that as an OER. It drew on on several very well-known uh, uh, institutions that have been working on quality assurance. Uh, there's the Quality Matters instrument, there's the European EFQUEL, uh, etc. And uh, you'll see on my slide share, there's an explanation of the external quality review process we did for 140 online courses that were developed uh, during that uh, five-year project. Uh, we've also been working uh, in South Africa with our uh, CHE, Center for Higher Education, uh, for on their uh, accreditation board, uh, where they've asked us to write, we've written a guide to their quality assurance criteria, and we have made a Moodle course assisting people to work through the guide. Uh, so uh, we have been attempting to, to work quite a lot in that area. Are there any other questions? To a PowerPoint presentation, we can also have a discussion around that. Uh, yes, Brenda, oh, we can I hear, just you. hear you. Oh. Any other questions? All right, if you think of any questions, what's good about the asynchronous aspect of learning and not the time-based is the fact that we can continue the discussions in uh, the course feed. The course feed, Brenda, I hope you've joined the, um, the Moodle MOOC uh, 4 on Liz IQ, so we can continue the discussion in the course feed, let me add the link. And that, oh, thank you, Tom. And that could be at any time. Uh, Brenda, we had, uh, we were discussing in the chat while you were talking because uh, these well, online I should presentations say that, uh, really open Sadie up and get us thinking uh, an NGO, about the so we don't of have courses, students as you mentioned, deadlines, in academics and other how, um, I think most uh, would agree that deadlines are kind so of many um, universities the bad aspect Africa, of taking I courses or courses or MOOCs and so on because they, uh, well, they force you to get into to stress and, and try to uh, figure out how to manage your time. Of, How of is it in Africa? Is it more uh, flexible? Having said that, um, I have found of that connectivity people are wonderful so at making a plan. Uh, the very, very first uh, Moodle design workshop that I that I gave, 
under that uh, PHEA project uh, was in Joss in Nigeria, uh, where the power went on and off, the internet went on and off, uh, and it was my first experience of something like that. And I think what kept me going was the fact that none of this phased any one of the close to 50 people that were in my workshop. Um, as power went off for internet, they simply gathered around two or three people. I mean, I'm talking about five years ago, so not everyone had laptops then. They would gather around the two or three people that had laptops that were independent of power, uh, that were prepared to use their own little uh, USB modems, and they carried on seamlessly. So it was a really good lesson for me to be patient and, uh, and, and work with, with what we could and do what we could. So it's, it's both. It's, yes, a certain amount of flexibility, uh, but also be, people being excellent at making a plan to get something done. Something very, very, very important. I'm wondering, I know for a fact that in South America, from my experiences in teaching at various organizations, that there's a lot of collaboration. There is a collaborative uh, work environment where everybody kind of pulls in and works together. I'm wondering uh, if that is uh, also um, a feature of, say, African universities or universities in Africa, where uh, there is this I mean, trend to work together. Uh, this is quite different from uh, North, Amer North America, where there's competition and collaboration, I don't know about Europe, and collaboration is problematic towards a goal of almost because of competition. Like it's all about me faculty. and my gains it'll, it'll and not about their turn us to and working together. Another degree. And people will really sincerely support them uh, in that. And I really like that. It, it, it's, I've seen, although it's kind of competitive at a high level, at a basic level, I've seen incredible support. Uh, Nelly, can I just quickly pick up uh, in the few minutes we've got? I see you've written Poodle here. Uh, in, in, in the text chat. Um, yes. Yeah. Can, you, can you tell I us about it a little bit? Yes. Um, my, in fact, my, my presentation at eLearning Africa in Uganda two weeks ago was entitled Offline Solutions for Online Learning. Uh, I was very fortunate to discover Poodle in 2010, uh, exactly when I needed it. And uh, it's been absolutely wonderful. Those people that developed it are a lifesaver. I wish I could give them a medal. Uh, it's solved all sorts of problems for us uh, and for the people that we work with. Uh, at first, I thought of it in terms of students having access to courses offline. And it's very valuable in that respect. Uh, instead of being given a bunch of resources on a CD, a student who gets their course on, on Poodle, which for those who aren't, don't know about it yet, um, it's just on a little uh, flash disk that you can plug into your machine. It looks exactly like Moodle. It doesn't. It leaves no footprint on your device to which you're plugging it in, uh, and it enables you to see your course and its resources. Uh, in the form of a real learning environment. It's not just a bunch of resources. In terms of the lecturers, the uptake was absolutely amazing, far beyond my expectations. Uh, it meant that lecturers could uh, work and develop their courses offline without expensive access to the internet. Uh, and in one particular institution, at this University of Dar es Salaam, their uptake was massive and they used it for all of their Moodle training, both for staff and students. It meant they weren't reliant even on the internet for staff and student training. Uh, again, you uh, should be able to see that um, uh, that slide share is also on Brenda 6. But it's it's wonderful. I can't I can't praise it enough. And thank you to its MAF Technologies for having developed that and releasing it free of charge to the Moodle community. Thereby, Tom, about 
uh, that version. As far as I know, um, I think Brenda, correct me if I'm wrong, it's for any version of Moodle? They two versions on their website. They had for 1.9 uh, and now they have, I think it's 2, I don't know if it's, I think it's 2.1 is their latest version. So, I mean, there are limitations, of course, in that uh, you, if, if you have a Moodle server where you've put a lot of add-on modules in, uh, then obviously they're not going to be in that version. Uh, and also, at the moment, uh, they don't synch uh, things like your core, etc., are not going to synchronize using Poodle. Um, there have been a number of synchronization research projects, which I, I mentioned in my paper a few weeks ago. Uh, uh, but they're kind of for a different context. It's, it's for losing connectivity while you're on Moodle. So that it's, it basically keeps a, a kind of log and then checks to see if you are connected and updates, etc. But it's, a, it's a, like a client-server version of Moodle. Poodle is truly a standalone uh, little memory stick. Uh, it's fantastic. It would work with uh, Justin Hunt uh, Poodle with, with, with the capital, two capital L's at the end. Are you familiar? It's also standalone. It's just a, an audio uh, mic and video where um, students can record to get themselves some, instead some of uh, writing text. Of or in addition you said to the with two L's. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's Justin Hunt. Uh, he's going to be presenting uh, next week. He's the developer. He's also a language, an English language teacher. He's was originally from New Zealand. He's based in um, actually in Japan. Here, I'll get the poodle for you. It's an amazing thing. What's nice is that you can get feedback and you can actually, uh, if you're interested in a certain feature, he'll do it. it. He also provides a whiteboard and you can draw on it and different things. He's now fully developing uh, poodle instead of teaching. He left his teaching job to focus on this. So there, I've added it to the chat box. That's the... Uh, yeah, that's the Justin Hunt. Right. Thank, thanks to, thank you to everyone so who join attended. Join the session and join uh, Moodle MOOC 4, okay, so we can continue, Brenda, so we can continue the discussion. Not today, but uh, at least you'll get messages when people uh, add and want maybe a response from you. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Brenda. Sorry I wasn't able to see you, oh, but uh, maybe next time. Right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for coming um, from around the world and uh, to this time.